Hello everyone, I'm Andrew with Everwood Creations. Today, I'm going to show you how to make this keepsake box with molded sides. In our previous video, we showed you how to make the molding that we used for the sides of this box. By using material that's not just flat and straight, you can add a lot of character to a little box like this that might otherwise look just a little bit plain. Come on, let me show you how it's done. Here we have our molding for the sides of the box. The first step is to sand it nice and smooth as it comes off the CNC machine with some tooling marks from the ball nose cutter. The best option here is hand sanding, so that you can fold and move the sandpaper to match the contours of the molding. Unlike a picture frame where the molding is flat, here we need to cut the 45 degree miters the other direction since the molding will be vertical. Using my digital angle gauge, I set the table saw blade to exactly 45 degrees. Now, using my miter gauge to make safe and accurate cross cuts, I cut the box sides to rough length. I will refine the miters here in a minute but I'm cutting them to rough length first so that I can sneak up on the exact fit. Now that all of the miters are close to the right length, I first nibble away at one of the sides up to the line. Then, laying it on the stopped blade of the saw, I set a stop block on the miter gauge, then cut the matching sides. This allows me to make sure the sides are the exact same length as each other, and I will end up with a square box. After checking the fit of the corners without any glue to make sure everything looks good, I get everything ready for the glue up. Having all of the pieces set in the loose band clamp allows me to keep everything organized. I apply glue to both sides of each corner because end grain will soak up a lot of glue, so I make sure to get a decent amount on there, and I will deal with any squeeze out later. Now it is just a matter of putting all the pieces together, applying light pressure from the band clamp, making sure all of the corners line up, and check for square. I continue to add a little more clamping pressure, and each time check for alignment and square. Once the clamp is tight and everything looks good, I just set it aside to dry overnight. The next day I take the box out of the clamps and it looks pretty good. There's a decent amount of glue squeeze out on the outside of some of the corners. So I pull off any that I can and then sand the rest away. It's important to get rid of all of the glue as this will affect the finish later. Sanding here also allows me to refine the shape of the corners a little. I made sure when I was gluing and clamping that this tiny amount of misalignment went to the outside of the corner and not the inside. Now I can sand the corners so they are perfect. Here I have the bottom of the box. I simply planed down a piece of walnut to a half inch thick. Then on a test piece, I routed the edge with a Roman OG pattern to see how large to cut the bottom so that the curve at the bottom of the molding would flow right into the OG pattern. Once I had the measurement, I cut the bottom to size. I chose which side would be the top and bottom, and then roughly marked where the router bit would be removing material so that I didn't make any mistakes. Now that I have the bottom for the box, and it's nice and flat, I can set the frame of the box on top of it and see if there are any high spots. Noting that there is a little bit of rock to the frame, I mark the high spots with a pencil, and then using a block plane, slowly remove material until the pencil marks are gone. Then test the fit again. After a few times of doing this, I have a perfect fit between the frame, or the sides of the box, and the bottom. Now it's time to glue the frame to the base. The problem here is that there has to be precise alignment between the two parts, and PVA wood glue likes to allow parts to slide around a little bit when you start to apply clamping pressure. There are some popular methods to deal with this problem, like sprinkling some salt in the glue to add a little bit of friction between the two parts, and then the salt dissolves in the wet glue. Another method, and the one I prefer if it is a place that I can do it, is to shoot some thin gauge short brad nails into the areas that are going to be joined together. I do this by tripping the safety on the nailer and holding it above the surface by half an inch or so, then carefully shoot the nails. This leaves them sticking up some. Now using side cutters, I can clip off the nail heads, leaving a short, sharp piece sticking out. Now I apply the glue and line the pieces up carefully. And then when I tap the top of the frame with a mallet, it drives the nails into the bottom, preventing any movement. Now I can clamp the pieces. Using a couple of squares of hardwood as clamping calls, I can clamp the frame to the bottom and do a final check for perfect alignment, and then clean up the glue squeeze out with a wet towel. After allowing the glue to dry overnight, I remove the box from the clamps. 
Using some folded sandpaper, I can clean up any remaining glue squeeze out at the junction between the sides and the bottom of the box. Now I have put what will be the top of the box on the CNC so that we can carve the personalized information here. After finding the center of the top by marking it with a light pencil line, I put it on the CNC machine and set the zero to that point. Now I just run the file to carve the information. This box is for a First Communion, so there is a name, a Bible quote, and a cross in the center. As you can see, it doesn't take long for the machine to do its work. Our plan here is to inlay the cross in the center of the lid with maple for a nice contrast. So here I have a piece of maple held down to the machine, and I run the corresponding file to cut the positive male cross to fit inside the negative carved cross on the lid. The machine takes a little more time to carve this since it has to remove the material all around the cross, leaving it standing up out of the wood. After the inlay is carved, I take it to the bandsaw and cut it out. There is no need to cut very close to the positive here. Just remove the extra material around it so it can sit down in the negative side with no interference. Now that I have both pieces, I can check the fit of the inlay. It seems like a fit is nice and snug. Using a stiff brush, I make sure there is nothing that will interfere with the fit during the glue up. And then I brush some glue on both surfaces. Now I simply place the inlay onto the lid and then clamp it nice and tight and set it aside to dry overnight. Now that the glue has dried and the inlay is secure in its pocket, I need to separate the two pieces. I secure the top and the leg vise, then using a Japanese back saw that has a nice thin kerf, I carefully saw the cross from the maple, making sure to keep the saw towards the maple side and away from the walnut lid so that I don't mar it up. The maple inlay is now standing proud of the walnut box lid, and obviously we want this to be flush and smooth. Using a hand plane is a quick and effective way to remove the excess material here. Planing first with the grain of the maple to avoid any tear out. And then once it's pretty much flush, planing with the grain of the walnut, since the maple is now fully supported all the way around, and such a small piece planing across the grain here is not a big deal. Now the inlay is perfectly smooth and level with the surface. To make the lid of the box have a better look as it transitions into the molding that is below it, we have decided to round over the edge. Taking it to the router table and using a round over bit, I am able to achieve this. I make sure to use a white charcoal pencil to roughly mark the area to be routed as the back of the lid will remain square. Taking a minute to do just a quick mark before you make the cut is a good way to save costly mistakes. We are getting pretty close to done with this project. The last major step is to mortise in the butt hinges for the lid. I start with measuring and deciding where they will look best on the box, and then place them where they need to be and marking their outline with a marking knife. Now, using a sharp quarter inch chisel, I begin to cut the mortises for the hinges. I begin by staying just slightly away from my marking knife line and cut straight down with the chisel. Since it's not a deep cut, instead of striking the chisel with a mallet, I just use the heel of my hand. Once the outline is cut a little deeper all the way around, I start from the outside and carefully pare in with very light cuts. The key here is to go slow and not remove much material at a time to avoid tear out. After the first pairing, I set the chisel right in my marking knife line and then repeat the process, making sure to check my depth often. Once it looks good, I mark the screw hole locations and then drill some small pilot holes, then attach the hinges to the box. Now I am able to carefully line up the lid and transfer the location of the hinges. The process is the same for the lid. Mark with a knife and then carefully chisel out the waste. Now that the hinges are secure and the lid is working well, it is time to finish the project. We have opted for Watco Natural Danish Oil here. The oil varnish blend will bring out the color of the grain in the wood and offer a base protection for the piece. I will allow this to cure overnight and then spray on a coat of protective lacquer. I hope you enjoy seeing how we've completed this project. You know, I'm really pleased with how this turned out. I think that the molded sides really did add a lot of character to the box. If you have any questions or comments, 
please go ahead and leave them down below. And if you've enjoyed this video, please make sure you like and subscribe. And until next time, have fun and stay safe in the shop.